بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم مائی ڈیئر اسٹوڈنٹس السلام علیکم بفور آئی اسٹارٹ ٹو ڈیز لیکچر لیٹ می جسٹ میک این امپورٹنٹ پوائنٹ اینڈ دیٹ از دیٹ واٹ وی آر ڈسکسنگ دیز ڈیز ڈیمانڈ سپلائی اکولیبریم موومنٹس الانگ دا ڈیمانڈ کرو الجیبرک ریپرزینٹیشن آف ڈیمانڈ اینڈ سپلائی گرافیکل اینڈ الجیبرک ریپرزینٹیشن آف اکولیبریم دس از ایٹ دا ہارٹ آف اکنامکس If you understand this well, economics will be easy for you at the bachelor's level, at the graduate level, at the postgraduate level. And if you do not understand this, then it will be hard for you in this course and in any other course. So make sure that you grasp fully the concepts of equilibrium, demand and supply, shifts in demand curves, shifts in supply curve, what causes equilibrium prices and quantities to change, which is what we will be discussing today. Make sure that you fully understand these. Attempt as many questions and examples that I've put up for you on the web or that are available in other textbooks, but make sure that you crack equilibrium to the core. Let's now start our lecture for today. So dear students, you might remember that in the last lecture, we talked about equilibrium. We started discussion on equilibrium We, develop, we developed an idea of why equilibrium analysis was necessary. We noted that when we talked about different demands at different prices, we were basically talking in a theoretical realm. In reality, you need to talk in the context of equilibrium prices as to what are the different equilibrium quantities demanded at different equilibrium prices. Then we also defined equilibrium. We defined equilibrium as a state in which there were no shortages and no surpluses. You know what a shortage is, right? A shortage is when the demand for something exceeds its supply. And a surplus is when the supply of something exceeds its demand. Then we illustrated graphically how equilibrium was reached. We saw how equilibrium quantity was arrived at, how equilibrium price was obtained. We also did the algebraic analogy of that and we solved out a supply function and a demand function for equilibrium prices and equilibrium quantities. What we could not discuss yesterday and what will be the focus of the lecture today will be to see how equilibrium changes in response to shifts in the demand or supply curves. Now naturally, the question that must come to your mind is that can both of these curves change at the same time or is it just one curve at a time that we will be looking at? Well, we will be looking at all possible permutations. And as we will see shortly, there are eight permutations in all. It is possible for just the supply curve to shift or just the demand curve to shift or it is possible for both curves to shift and they can shift in the same direction or in opposing directions. So let's now develop an understanding of how equilibrium responds to these shifts in the demand and supply curves. Let's go to our series of slides for this lecture. As we noted earlier, equilibrium price and or equilibrium quantity change when the market demand and or market supply curves shift. So that's the starting point. Then we need to see which of these curves have shifted. Is it the demand curve or the supply curve or both? Now there are eight possibilities in all and we we'll list these shortly. Let's first illustrate our uh, example by three possibilities. One is when the demand curve shifts, one is when the supply curve shifts and one in which both demand and supply curves shift in the same direction. We use our example of corn that we've been talking about throughout our demand and supply lectures to illustrate these shifts and see how equilibrium responds to these shifts. Now the market demand and market supply schedules for corn to are plotted in the figure. These have been labeled as D and S respectively. Equilibrium price is $3 per bushel and equilibrium quantity is 6,000 bushels. Now in our first example, we see what would happen 
when there is an increase in the price of wheat, which is a substitute grain. As you know, when the price of a substitute good increases, the demand for this good increases because people will switch from that more expensive substitute to this good. So in this case, when the price of wheat goes up, this shifts the demand for corn outwards from D to D prime. The equilibrium price of corn rises from $3 to $3.5, which is at the new intersection point. And the equilibrium quantity increases from 6,000 bushels to 6,500 bushels. Now let's take our second example, where we have the supply curve shifting. Suppose that in the absence of any change in demand, a larger than expected corn harvest let's say due to good rainfall, which would be a positive nature shock, shifts the supply curve down and to the right, from S to S prime. The price of corn in this case will fall from $3 to $2.5, while the equilibrium quantity will rise from 6,000 bushels to 7,000 bushels. In our third example, we will see what happens when both demand and supply curves shift to the right. Suppose increases in the demand and supply for corn shift the curves to the right from D to D prime and from S to S prime. Equilibrium price remains at three dollars while equilibrium quantity increases to eight thousand bushels. Equilibrium price is greater than three dollars when the demand increase is greater than the increase in supply. For example, if the demand shift is greater than D prime while the supply shift is from S to S prime. On the other hand, equilibrium price falls below $3 when the increase in demand is less than the D to D prime while the increase in supply is from S to S prime. Thus, my friends, when market demand and market supply are both shifting in the same direction, the resulting equilibrium price depends upon the magnitude of the increase in demand relative to the increase in supply. If the increase in the demand is greater than the increase in supply, there will be an increase in the equilibrium price. In the other case, if the increase in supply is greater than the increase in demand, the equilibrium price will go down. Now let's review the rest of the five examples or permutations that can obtain when either demand or supply curves shift or when both shift. Note that we have discussed three examples. One in which only the demand curve shifted outward. One in which the supply curve shifted outward to the right and one in which both the supply and the demand curves shifted outwards to the right. In our fourth example, we will assume that nothing happens to supply and the demand curve shifts inward. Now, can any one of you give me an example of what change in factor would cause the demand curve to shift inwards? Yes? Yes, good. The demand can fall because of let's say a fall in income or because of the fall in the price of a substitute good or because of the increase in the price of a complementary good. All of these factors will cause the demand curve to move inwards to the left. What happens to equilibrium, the new equilibrium? What will happen is that we will move from the old equilibrium to the new equilibrium by moving downwards and to the left along the supply curve. What will happen to price is that it will fall and quantity will also fall. So in this case, that is when only demand shifts inwards and nothing happens to supply, we have both equilibrium price and equilibrium quantity falling. Now let's take a look at our fifth example. In this case, let's assume that nothing happens to demand, whereas the supply curve shifts inward. Now, can anyone give an example of why the supply curve would shift inwards? 
Yes. Good. The example that comes to my mind immediately is that of Gulabi Sundi and American Sundi, which affects our cotton production. So let's say farmers have planted the cotton crop and suddenly we are attacked by Gulabi Sundi or American Sundi. This will mean that our total possible supply of cotton will be reduced at any price. And this will cause the supply curve to shift inwards. What will happen to equilibrium price and equilibrium quantity? This is simple to see. We will move from the initial intersection along the supply curve, along the demand curve in the northwestern direction and reach the new equilibrium. At this new equilibrium, prices have risen and the quantity demanded or the quantity supplied the equilibrium quantity would have fallen. So when supply falls and demand does not change, this results in an increase in price and a reduction in quantity. Now let's move to our sixth example. Let's look at this new graph. In this, let us assume that demand increases while supply falls. Again, let's try to think of this in terms of real world examples. Demand could increase because of a fall in the price of a complementary good. So let's say if this was the curve for the demand for cars and petrol prices fell, then the demand for cars would increase and therefore the demand curve would shift to the right. On the supply side, what could cause a fall in supply? We gave the example of natural shocks like, like uh, viruses or gulabi sundi etc causing the supply curve to shift inwards in our previous example. Another example of a factor which would cause the supply curve to shift inwards could be a rise in input costs. For example, a rise in the price of raw materials or a rise in the price of wages. Now, combining these two effects, that is the demand curve shifting to the right and the supply curve shifting to the left, we see that equilibrium quantity is indeterminate. The change in the equilibrium quantity cannot be determined. It could increase or it could decrease. It depends on the exact magnitude of the shifts in the supply or the demand curves. On the other hand, we can be sure about the direction in which price changes. Price will increase from point E to point E1. And this is quite simple to see. An increase in demand also pulls the price in an upward direction and an increase or a decrease in supply also pulls the price in an upward direction. So when we see that demand increases and supply falls, price will increase, but the change in quantity cannot be determined up front. Now let's look at our seventh example. In this graph, we see that the supply curve shifts to the right, whereas the demand curve shifts to the left. Now let's think of some more examples. Why would the demand curve shift to the left? Let's say the demand curve shifts to the left because of expectations of a future fall in price. So if future prices are expected to fall, then consumers will defer their production, their, their consumption of that good until the time that the price has fallen. Therefore, the demand curve will shift inwards. Now, on the supply side, the curve could shift outwards because of a technological breakthrough which reduces, let's say, the cost of production and enables producers to produce more of the quantity at the same price or at any price. Now, given these two opposing shifts, that is the supply curve shifting to the right and the demand curve shifting to the left, we can see that equilibrium price will fall while the change in the quantity, equilibrium quantity, is still undetermined. It depends again on the exact magnitude of the shift in the supply curve or the shift in the demand curve. If the shift in the supply curve is greater than the shift in the demand curve, the equilibrium quantity will increase. If the shift in the demand curve, that leftward shift, is greater, however, the quantity will go down. So this was our seventh example.
Let's now look at our eighth and final example. In this case, we have both the demand and the supply curves shifting inwards. Yes, now I leave it to you to guess what would happen to price. Hmm, as you can see, it is a tricky business. It's not clear whether the price will increase or decrease. It depends again on the magnitudes of the shifts in supply and the shifts in demand. If the inward shift in supply is greater than the inward shift in demand, prices will rise. But if the inward shift in demand is higher, that is the leftward, southward movement in the demand curve is higher, then the price will fall. In either case, however, there is an unambiguous decrease in the equilibrium quantity. Now let's summarize these eight graphs that we've gone through in a table. We can see that when demand increases, that is when the demand curve shifts to the right, but the supply curve is unchanged, both price and quantity go up. When there is no change in the demand curve, but the supply curve shifts out, price falls but quantity rises. When the demand curve shifts outwards to the right and the supply curve also shifts to the right, quantity increases but it is difficult to say what the direction of change in price will be. Then in our fourth example we saw that when demand falls but supply remains constant, price will go down and quantity will go down as well. In our fifth example we saw that if demand was unchanged, but the supply curve shifted inwards, price would go up and quantity would go down. In our sixth example, we saw that if the demand and supply curves shifted in opposite directions, that is if demand shifted to the right and supply shifted to the left, price would increase, but it would not be possible to predict the change in quantity until we had information on the magnitudes of the shifts in the supply and demand curves. In our seventh example, we saw that if demand shifted to the left and supply shifted to the right, the supply curve that is, price would fall, but the change in the quantity would remain indeterminate until the, mag the magnitude of changes in the supply and demand curves is known. Finally, we saw that if both demand and supply curves shifted to the left, then the change in price would remain indeterminate because it would depend on the relative magnitudes of shifts in the demand and supply curves, but that the quantity, the equilibrium quantity, would fall unambiguously. So that, my friends, is a summary of the eight graphs, laborious graphs that we went through. Note that you should be fully comfortable with these graphs and that a good grasp of these concepts is essential to your future understanding of economics. Now there are three points to note about the graphs and the summary table that we've uh, set up. One, whenever there is a shift in the demand curve, the new equilibrium is obtained by moving along the supply curve. And whenever there is a shift in the supply curve, the new equilibrium is obtained by moving along the demand curve. So when both demand and supply curves shift, you can think of first moving along the demand curve and then moving along the supply curve. Or you could think of first moving along the supply curve and then moving along the demand curve. Now we've talked a lot about these graphs and moving along curves and shifts. Let's now apply all these concepts to reality. So let's now do some more practice about how equilibrium quantity and equilibrium price would change in a real situation caused by shifts in demand and supply. Let's take the example of but butter and let's see what will happen to the equilibrium price and quantity of butter in each of the following cases. You should state whether demand or supply or both have shifted and in which direction. We have six, six possible cases, or is it seven? Yes, seven. A, a rise in the price of margarine. B, a rise in the demand for milk. 
C. A rise in the price of bread. D. A rise in the demand for bread. E. An expected rise in the price of butter in the near future. F. A tax on butter production. G. The invention of a new but expensive process for removing all cholesterol from butter, plus the passing of a law which states that all butter producers must use this process. Now what I will do is will give you hints as to what happens in each of these cases to demand and supply. And then it will be up to you to match the configuration with the eight permutations that we have analyzed. So let's see what happens in the case of A. As you know, margarine is a substitute for butter. Therefore, a rise in the price of margarine will cause the demand for butter to increase. Right? So this will shift the demand curve to the right. Also, however, a rise in the price of margarine will increase its relative profitability to butter. And therefore, producers will shift from butter production to margarine production. Thus, the supply curve for butter will shift inwards. Right? So, the demand curve shifts outward, whereas the supply curve shifts inwards. Now, let's look at case B now. There is a rise in the demand for milk. Now, the effect that this will have on milk prices is obvious. A rise in the demand for milk will raise milk prices. This, in turn, will induce producers to produce more milk. But as you know, butter is produced as a byproduct of the milk production process. And therefore, the supply of butter will also increase. So the supply curve for butter will shift to the right. On the other hand, if you think of milk as a substitute good to butter, in that consumers are balancing their intake of milk and butter, then an increase in the demand for milk will mean a decrease in the demand for butter. And therefore, the demand curve for butter will shift inwards. Let's now look at C, where there is a rise in the price of bread. Now, as you know, bread is a complementary good for butter. So, a rise in its price will mean a fall in the demand for butter. And therefore, the demand curve will shift to the left. I do not see any reason to shift the supply curve for butter in this case. Then we have part D, in which there is a rise in the demand for bread. A rise in the demand for bread means that there would be a rise in the demand for butter as well, because they are complementary goods. So the demand curve in this case would shift to the right. E, an expected rise in the price of butter, which is case E, will shift the demand and supply curves in opposite directions. As you can well imagine, an increase in the price, an expected increase in the price of butter will cause producers to stock up and lock butter in their fridges so that they can sell it off at the higher price once the price goes up. On the other hand, consumers would be desperate to buy butter today and stock it up for their future consumption because the price of butter is going to go up in the near future. So in this case, the supply curve shifts inward whereas the demand curve shifts outward. F, a tax on butter production. This will shift the supply curve up because it represents an increase in the production cost because it's a tax on butter production. There will be no impact on the demand curve. G, the invention of a new but expensive process for removing all cholesterol from butter plus the passing of a law which states that all butter product producers must use this process. Now, this is an interesting example. The invention of a new technology usually means that the supply curve shifts to the right. However, in this case, the new technology is expensive, and because the use of it is mandatory, it increases the production cost, and therefore, it will shift the supply curve inwards. On the other hand, because the technology removes cholesterol from butter, this technology improves the quality of the product for many. Many people who are wary of cholesterol consumption will now be able to consume butter 
and therefore their demand for butter will increase. So the demand curve in this case will shift outwards. Now I've laid down these seven examples before you. It's up to you now to match each of these configurations with the permutations given earlier of the eight graphs and see what would happen to equilibrium quantity and equilibrium price in each of these cases. Now technically my friends we are in a position to see how government has a role to play in equilibrium analysis, how governments can influence equilibrium positions, equilibrium prices, equilibrium quantities. However before we get to that and that's a very important part of this lecture, we need to tackle one last problem, which is that of identification. The identification problem arises when the shape or the location of the demand and supply curves is not fully known. What does this mean? Now, because of the various permutations that we saw, that either demand can change or supply can change or demand and supply can both change, it is sometimes not possible to say whether a particular change in price and quantity is because of a shift in just the demand curve or because of a shift in both the demand and supply curves. So when you do not know the exact shape or location of the demand and supply curves, it is possible for you to make a wrong inference in saying that this particular change in equilibrium price and quantity is caused by a change in the demand curve when actually it is a result of a change in both the supply and the demand curves. Let's illustrate this through the use of a slide. Let us say we want to identify the demand curve for tennis balls. We observe that when the price was 20 rupees, 1000 tennis balls were purchased. At a later date, the price has let's say written, risen to 30 rupees and now 800 balls are purchased. What can we conclude from this about the demand curve? The answer is that without further information, we can conclude very little. Consider figures 1 and 2. Both are consistent with the facts. In figure 1, the demand curve has not shifted. The rise in price and the fall in sales are due entirely to a shift in the supply curve. The movement from point A to B is thus a movement along the demand curve. If we can be certain that the demand curve has not shifted, then the evidence allows us to identify its position, or at least two points on it. In figure two, however, not only has the supply curve shifted, but so also has the demand curve. Let us assume that people's preference or taste for tennis balls have increased. In this case, a movement from A to B does not trace out the demand curve. We cannot derive the demand curve from the evidence of price and quantity alone. The main problem is that when the supply curve shifts, we often cannot know whether or not the demand curve has shifted as well, and if it has, by how much. How would we know, for example, just how much people's tastes have changed? The problem works the other way around too. It is difficult to identify a supply curve when the demand curve shifts. Is the change in price and quantity entirely due to the shift in the demand curve or has the supply curve shifted too? This is the question we are confronted with. This problem is what we call the identification problem. It is difficult to identify just what is causing the change in price and quantity. Note that the identification problem arises when both price and quantity change. Now in the discussion so far on equilibrium analysis, we have seen that in a state of equilibrium there are no shortages, there are no surpluses. The Consumers and the producers agree on a certain price and that determines the quantity that will clear in the market. So at some level you might be thinking this is the ideal situation that can be. Well, some people do hold that view. The free market economists who believe very strongly in the power of the market to obtain efficient results, they believe 
that it is not desirable to interfere with the market and whatever equilibrium the market decides is optimal for the society. However, this is where the fundamental difference of opinion comes between free market economies and socialist or planned economies. And the main difference is that it is possible for some other equilibrium to be more desirable than the free market equilibrium. And indeed, it might be possible that a state of disequilibrium might be more desirable than the free market equilibrium. So this is where the role of government comes in. Now we'll see that the government can impact equilibrium in two fundamental ways. It can impact equilibrium or it can take an economy out of equilibrium to be precise by imposing ceilings and floors. And we are talking here about price ceilings and price floors. What do these mean? Now price ceilings, to illustrate an example, could be that the government does not want the prices of certain essential medicines to go very high. Right? So it can impose a price ceiling. It can say the price of this particular injection or this particular medicine will not go higher than this limit because it will affect the social good of people. It will affect patients who are poor. They will not be able to buy this medicine. On the other hand, the government might be interested in, in imposing price floors, right? That the minimum price a certain good can take. And you can think of an example in which the government might want to set a minimum wage to ensure that every person who is working in the economy earns a minimum wage which is enough for him to keep himself and his family. The government could also impose minimum prices for crops in order to encourage agriculture and look after the interests of farmers. So you could have support prices for crops like wheat or crops like rice and cotton. These are very common policies and are, and are practiced in countries which, which purport to be free market economies themselves. Now, let's develop a better understanding of how the government can play this role of um, introducing price floors and price ceilings. And let's also see how the government can fundamentally affect the demand and supply curves by shifting them. That's the second way in which the government can affect equilibrium. In the second case, the government will merely move the economy from one equilibrium to another. In the first case, the government will move the economy from a state of equilibrium to a state of disequilibrium. So let's refer to our slides for this. Now let's take the example of an economy which starts at point E. This is a particular market for a certain good, right? And the equilibrium quantity is QE while the equilibrium price is PE. Now what would be the impact of imposing a price floor in this market? So let's say this is the market for labor and the government does not want the wages of labor to fall below a certain level. But let's say that certain level is higher than what would be obtained in a free market equilibrium. So that PF is higher than PE. Now the result of setting a wage rate above what would clear the market would be that at that wage rate, workers would be willing to supply more labor. So they would be willing to supply, let's say, Q3 hours of labor. However, firms which are the consumers or demanders of labor will be discouraged by the high wage rate and will only demand Q1 workers, right? Or Q1 labor hours. This will mean that there will be unemployment or a surplus of workers in the market equal to Q3 minus Q1. So this is an example in which the imposition of a price floor causes the economy from moving from a state of equilibrium to a state of surplus. Now let's take a look at the converse example in which there is an imposition of a price ceiling. Let's now say this is the example of the market for medicines. 
and the government does not want the price of a certain medicine to rise above PC. What will happen in this case? In this case, consumers of this medicine will demand Q4 units of this medicine. But the producers, the firms producing this medicine will not have an incentive to produce more than Q2 units of this medicine. This will therefore produce a situation in which demand exceeds supply. And you know the word that we have for this situation. Yes, it's called a shortage. So in this case, the economy has moved from a state of equilibrium to a state of shortage. So this is two examples of how government intervention can move the economy from a state of equilibrium to a state of disequilibrium. Note that we are not saying anything about whether this new state of disequilibrium is better or worse than the initial equilibrium. All we are saying is that in this new scenario, we have either a surplus or a shortage. It is up to the society or the government to decide whether this surplus or shortage is more desirable compared to the state of equilibrium in which price is equal to PE and quantity is equal to QE. Now let's refer to the other slide, the other case in which the government can affect equilibrium in a market. And this can be when the government alters an equilibrium price by changing market demand and or market supply. The government can restrict demand by rationing a good, for example. In this case, it will do it by shifting the demand schedule to the left. Now, do you know what, what it means when a good is rationed? When a good is rationed, an individual not only must be willing and financially able to buy a commodity, but also must possess a government-issued coupon which permits purchase. Rations are very common in times of war or in times when food crops are in short supply. Equilibrium price can also be altered by shifting the market supply curve. For example, a tax on a particular good to be paid by the producer every time he sells that good will raise its supply price and shift the market supply curve to the left. This causes the equilibrium price to increase and the equilibrium quantity to fall. By contrast, a subsidy to the producer lowers the commodity's supply price, shifts market supply to the right and results in a lower equilibrium price and a larger equilibrium quantity. Now let's see the example of a tax and how it affects equilibrium in the market. We illustrate this through the use of a market supply and demand curve S and D shown in the figure. Equilibrium price is initially P0 while equilibrium quantity is Q0. And let's say we are talking about the market for petrol in this case. As you know, petrol is a scarce resource, requires us to use our foreign exchange to import and the government is always keen to stress efficient usage of petrol. So if the government wants to reduce petrol consumption, it can do so by imposing a tax. The government can impose a tax of let's say rupees 5 on each litre sold by petrol pumps and this would decrease their demand, the market supply curve and shift it inwards left to S1. This in turn will raise the equilibrium price to P1. Equilibrium quantity will then fall from Q0 to Q1 in line with the desires of the government. Now, what are the specific steps that we have followed in this? Firstly, we have drawn a diagram showing the market conditions before any change takes place. Then we work out if the change, that is the increased tax, causes a shift in the supply curve or the demand curve. In this case, the tax will affect the supply curve because it essentially increases the cost of production or the cost of supplying petrol. So petrol pumps will charge a higher price. And so the supply curve can be seen as vertically going up. It will go up by exactly the amount of the tax. So if the tax is 5 rupees per unit, the supply curve will shift vertically upwards 
by 5 rupees. Next, we will work out the direction of the shift. In this case, as we have seen, the direction is leftward. Finally, we draw the shifted curve on the diagram to see what the new equilibrium will be. And then, we indicate the new market price and quantity by P1 and Q1. The, con the conclusion of this analysis is that market prices will increase and quantity traded, both bought and sold, will decrease in response to a tax. Now, what happens in the case of a subsidy? That is, when the government gives an incentive payment to producers to produce more of a good. Right? And let's say, in this case, we can give the example of CNG. As you know, the government wants to replace petrol consumption by consumption of resources which are naturally or locally produced. And therefore, CNG is a good example. So, in order to encourage more CNG pumps, the government can provide a subsidy to petrol pumps selling CNG. And the subsidy could be in the form of a payment, let's say 2 rupees per, uh, per unit of CNG sold. In this case, the supply curve will shift downwards by the amount of the subsidy. As seen from the graph, equilibrium will shift from point E0 to point E1 and the price will move down from P0 to P1. In the process, the quantity of CNG sold will increase from Q0 to Q1. It is important to note that in both these cases, that is, in the case of imposition of a tax, or in the case of provision of a subsidy, the supply curve shifts vertically up or down by the amount of the tax per unit. So if you extend the supply curve, the two supply curves to the vertical axis, you should be able to see that the difference on that scale should be exactly equal to the tax imposed. So the difference in the first case should be exactly equal to 5 rupees, and the difference in the second case should be exactly equal to 2 rupees. So my friends, that was a basic intro on what role the government could play in price and output determination in a market economy. Now obviously the role of government is a very contentious issue. Some people say the government should be very active. And as I said, free market economists say that the government should virtually play no role at all. What I want to stress is that there are many situations and many arguments in which either case can be made. And we've just discussed only two or three. Further down, we will discuss cases in which the marginal social cost of a good is different from the marginal private cost, and so the government uh, might have a role to play in ensuring that the good is produced to the level where the marginal social cost equals the marginal benefit. And we'll see what those terms mean subsequently. But the role of government is a very broad area, and we've only just touched upon it. Now, let's try to sum up on what we've learned today in this lecture. We started with the discussion of equilibrium and how the equilibrium price and quantity would change in response to changes or shifts in either the demand curve or the supply curve. We saw that there were eight possible permutations. We could either have the demand curve shift, we could, could shift rightwards, it could shift leftwards, or we could have the supply curve shift. It could shift leftwards, it could shift rightwards, or we could have both the supply and the demand curves shifting either in opposite directions or in the same directions. In some of these cases, we could accurately predict what would happen to prices and quantities. But in other cases, we could only predict what would happen to one variable and would not know what would happen to the other unless we had the information on the exact magnitudes of the shifts in the supply and the demand curves. Then we also looked at the problem of identification of demand and supply. And we saw that in some cases, when both the price and the quantity change, it is not possible to tell whether the change has been induced by only a change or a shift in the demand curve, 
or whether both curves, that is both the supply and the demand curves have shifted. And this can be a major problem when the shape or position of the market demand and supply curves is not known up front. Finally, my friends, we discussed the role of government. And we said that the government can intervene in two fundamental ways. The government can either directly set prices, so it can set price floors, or it can set price ceilings. It will set price floors when it does not want the price of a certain good to fall below a certain level. And we gave the example of the wage rate or the support prices for crops to help farmers. On the other hand, the government could impose price ceilings. And this the government would do when it does not want the price of a certain commodity to rise very high. And we gave the example of medicines. The government might want the price of medicines to remain affordable for the common man. So if it left the price of medicines to the market, the prices might rise to a level where the common man cannot afford it. So that is a logical case for intervention and setting a price ceiling. But some people say that by intervening, the government actually increases or accentuates the problem and not solves it. But we will discuss this in greater detail in subsequent lectures. We also saw that the government could shift the supply and demand curves and cause the economy to move from one equilibrium to another equilibrium. And we gave the example of rationing, in which case the demand curve shifted to the left. Or we gave the examples of taxes, which caused the supply curve to shift up. Or the example of subsidies, which caused the supply curve to shift down. All of these cases caused the economy to move from one equilibrium to a new equilibrium. It is another matter whether the new equilibrium is a more desirable one or not a more desirable one. But what does happen is that the equilibrium state changes. In our next lecture, my friends, we'll talk about elasticities. What are elasticities? Well, elasticities are at the heart of supply and demand. We have discussed the law of demand in that the quantity demanded of any good increases when the price falls. But we have not understood at what rate the quantity demanded increases or how much it increases when the price falls. So there has to be a measure of that. Similarly, we saw that when the price of a good increased, the quantity supplied would increase with it because the profitability went up. But again, we did not develop any measure of how much the quantity supplied would increase. So whether, in our example of the farmer, whether the farmer would just increase potato production from that half piece of land to the full piece of, of that valley that he had, or whether he would use the hills surrounding that valley also for potato production. In order to answer those questions, we need to develop a measure for the responsiveness of demand and supply to price. And that is what elasticities are defined as. The elasticity of demand is the change in demand caused by a change in price. To be precise, the elasticity of demand is the percentage change in quantity demanded of a product divided by the percentage change in the price of that product. The elasticity of supply is the change, the percentage change in the quantity supplied of a particular product divided by the percentage change in the price of that particular product. So we will answer those questions in our next lecture, which will be on elasticities. Once we have developed a good understanding of elasticities, we will be able to understand the role of government better as well, as to in which cases the government's role is more desirable and in which cases it is less desirable. In which cases is tax policy likely to be effective and in which cases it is unlikely to be effective. So we'll answer all those questions in subsequent lectures after we've developed a basic understanding of elasticities. So with that, my friends, we conclude today's lecture.
I personally have really enjoyed giving you this lecture because I think this is one of the most interesting and important parts of microeconomics. Understanding what demand is, what supply is, and how the two interact to produce equilibrium in an economy, and then how the government, or in a market, and how the government can then influence that particular equilibrium by either taking the economy out of equilibrium or by changing the nature of the equilibrium itself. I hope that you are also picking up these concepts as you go along and developing the requisite comfort level with the graphical illustrations. That is very important. So go through the questions I've put up for you on the web, practice those questions and see if you get to the bottom of these concepts. Inshallah, till the next lecture, it is Khuda Hafiz and Salaamu Alaikum.